So this week we're doing some more web stuff, which you'll remember from two weeks ago, I think, if you were here. And if this is your first time, welcome hacking. Um, <laughs> I don't know, watch the, watch the lecture videos. I have a quick spiel on security, because I can never do that enough. So security is a really fun field, because it's not, like most of computing is just about solving problems, and it's kind of like, you think about a problem, and then you think about how you solve the problem, and then you write a solution and write some code or whatever. But in security, you think about how someone else would have solved the problem and what stupid mistakes they would have made, and then you take advantage of their mistakes to break into things. Like it's so much, you, you both get to make things and break into things. So it's like double fun, in my opinion. So this week we're talking about web hacking. So if you weren't here two weeks ago, you might be confused, but that's okay. Just ask lots of questions and stop me at any point and we can discuss things. And hopefully this is going to record like the microphone to the camera and be magic because, I don't know, it's not very good sound in the past. Okay, so the actual contents of this lecture that are hacking related, we're going to do some more SQL injection stuff, some cool stuff, some other cool SQL stuff, um, what you can do if there's no visible error or output, so how you can actually hack stuff without being able to see your hacking stuff, I guess, and some cool demos and some cool, to cool tools. So it's a bit underprepared, but hopefully it comes out okay. I've got some demos and they worked 20 minutes ago, so they might still work. So for those of you who didn't understand last time or who weren't here, SQL is like a language you use to talk to databases, and so you have commands like select or insert or update or delete. So you can say like, Got to stop saying like. Um, select star from users, and if you've got a users table, it's got like an ID, a name, and an age. Then this will select all of these fields from this table about all of the users. Um, and so you can do insert to insert things in, update to update things, delete to delete things. Like it's, they do the obvious things. The syntax for them I'm not going to cover too much, but you can Google it if you forget, which you probably will unless it's really obvious. Like I Google it all the time, so it's, it's fine. But the, the one we're going to focus on is select because when you have a website that's talking to a database, it'll be doing select commands and those are where you can do the injection. So the select command, select column names from table name, or select star from table name. So that's just how you select things. And so for what's star? Well, star means everything. So rather than specific things like ID, yeah. name, age, it'll star will mean get all of them. Cool. Yeah. So normally in a web query, we have three colors, like column one, column two, column three from table one, where column four equals string one, and column five equals integer one, and column six equals integer two. So maybe like you know, select, I don't know, login favorite things from users where username equals whatever they've logged in as and password equals password and valid equals one or something like that. So on the website, it's quite a complex bunch of things strung together like this. But if we can control the input, so if we can type in string one as our username or as our whatever we're typing in, then we can enter whatever we like. And if it's not being escaped properly, then we can do things like blah, quote, or one equals one. And what this will do is it will check for each column, it'll check if the name or whatever is blah, or if one is equal to one. And because one is gonna be equal to one, it'll succeed for every user. So Bob's name isn't blah, but one is equal to one, so that's, that's gonna succeed. Joe's name is not blah, but one is equal to one, so it's gonna succeed, and so on. So that's one way of selecting everyone rather than just a specific person. Um, so another useful thing is that we can do a union command. So often with SQL injection like this, we can only control the end of the command or somewhere in the middle, but we can't control the whole statement. So we can't make a whole new one. So if we have something like this that's already selecting users and logging them in or selecting photos or selecting whatever, we can't just go... And by the way, also select the password from the password field because you can't just start a new select thing. It's got to be part of the, the line that's being executed. But what we can do is a thing called a union select, which if you're familiar with unions from discrete maths or whatever course you learn them in, like that'll join 
I don't even know what a union is. Like if you've got set A and set B, then a union is all of the things that match both of them. Yeah, so that'll be the joining part. No, that's the intersect. Yeah, it's, it's all of it. Okay, cool. I thought that seemed wrong. So how this works in SQL is that if we union select some column names from table one and some column names from table two, it'll pair them up in the output. So if the output's expecting like three things, and we also union select this with maybe the passwords table, which has like one, two, three, password, 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 thing, 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 then it'll come out saying like these things and then these things. So it'll give them out in the format that that's expecting. That seems kind of unclear. Does that make sense? It'll make more sense with the example that's coming up. So if we have a, a statement that's saying select things from articles where ID equals three, we can't say select password because it's looking in the articles table. But we can say select three union select ID, log, and password from users. And that means that wherever it prints out the ID, name, and price, and the article is on the web page, it'll also print out the ID, logon, and password for each of the users. Um, if they're not called those names, like ID, logon, and password. Yeah, then it won't do anything. It'll just give you an error saying no such table name. Can you do like star, star, star? Uh, you can't do star, but you can do something like one, and it'll just give you the number one, for example. You can't select star in the union. Yep. Yeah, it's got to be the same number of columns, which we're going to get to in a minute, I think. I don't remember what all of my things go. So the things we need to know for the union select are the number of columns, where they actually get displayed on the web page. So if you know the URL of the picture gets displayed as a URL of a picture or something. Uh, we need to know information about the metadata of the database, so the names of the tables, because if the users table isn't called users, then we can't just, well, we could just guess a lot of things. But if we, you know, we have to eventually get the name of it to be able to get the passwords from it. And then once we've got all of those things, we can get the information out of the tables. So if we have the number of columns wrong, like select this ID equals three, union select one, one will just return one as a number. This will go as an error saying invalid number of columns in select statement or something like that. But if we selected one, two, three, then it'll work and it'll just print out one, two, and three. Um, does that make sense? <coughs> cool, so now I'm going to show you on this one, if I can remember how. So if you guys remember this one from last time, it's a website, and you found that if you put a quote in there, you get an error, which means that it's going to be exploitable because we're getting an error. So that means that the stuff that we type in in the ID field is directly added into the database or executed into the database. So whatever we type in here will be evaluated in the database. So this will look like this thing here. It'll be selecting some number of things from some table where ID equals something. So if we type in to union select one, we should get an error saying different number of columns. So we can go through and guess how many columns there is. So you know, one, one, two, one, two, three, four. So clearly there were four columns because we just I don't know if you can see that we typed in one, two, three, four, and then it worked once you got to four. And so what's happened down here, if you view the page source, is that you can see the number three that we selected has come up as the name of the image, and the two that we selected has come up as the name. So the one and the four got lost somewhere. You look so shocked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So does this make sense so far? We, can, we need to work out the number of columns in the select statement that's being run on the back end, that's running the web server, yeah. in order to so, work out. So like yep. three is the actual image, yep. and two is the... So it's probably saying something like select whatever one is, two would be name, three would be image, four would be something else from photos where ID equals whatever gets passed in. So why do we need the three then? Can't we just pass all the data that we want to see to the two? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we can we can make the two be the field that we want if we know what field we want. Like if we want the password to come up, then we can do that. 
but we need to actually know what the names of the tables are that we want to look at. So if it's not called users, like we can say, you know, union select um, from users. I know that's going to work. Um, yeah, so we need to know the table names and the column names and the table names to be able to select the things from users. Okay, so does that make sense so far? Cool. So, because there'll be different tables, right? Yep. Can you use numbers to refer to the tables? You have to refer to them by the uh, Tables have names, and I think you have to refer to them by names, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so... Cool, so the next thing is getting table names. So we can do, like, the actual information about the database, including what the tab tables are called, is stored inside the database itself. So we can select table name from information underscore schema dot tables, and this will give us the table name. So if we put this into our thing from here, um, what was it, information... dot tables. So two was the name, so if we make that one be table name, then you can see it's selected all of the table names. So this is, it's got a table called character sets, a table called collations. Um, the ones that we care about are probably going to be users and pictures. So pictures will be the one that we're already in with the pictures and users will be the one with the usernames, probably. Like, they could have put the usernames in one called, like, table privileges just to throw us off, but it's probably going to be the one called users. user privileges I think that's about the database user privileges, so saying which database users have which privileges. Um, and then we can get the column names from information schema.columns, so let's do that as well. Um, so, sorry, if all of these, uh, if we're able to exploit column number, or sorry, I think, um, table number two, or column number two, I think, whichever yep. one it was, does that mean that the uh, incorrectly typed um, SQL command or um, query was in that bit of the website, or what is, why does two come up rather than... Uh, so two comes up because the field from the database that's being selected is being shown. So, so in the original query, yeah, yeah, in the original query it would have been like it was the table with the picture name. So there would have been a field called name inside the table called pictures, right. and, and that's what's being printed by the back end to the page. Then how, uh, if if we were creating a website that, um, then we accidentally uh, screwed up the like a PHP query and like left something unclosed. <clears throat> is there any way to tell from doing this kind of stuff where the mistake was? Uh, so what do you mean by left it unclosed? Uh, as in, so uh, if we're able to put a um, thing at the end of the URL, then doesn't that mean that the statement was left unclosed? Uh, so putting a quote at the end means that it closes it prematurely. Oh, so right. it was already closed, and now we've closed it here. And so the, the stuff that was previously there, like oh, if you look at... <clears throat> this sort of thing. Okay. There was this quote here, but we've put another quote in here. So if we didn't have anything after this, there would be an error because we'd have an extra quote. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Cool. All right. So if we also get the column names. No. Nope. Which slide was it on? Column underscore names. Mm -hmm. yes, just column name. Yeah. Name. Yep. Reading is pretty hard. Cool, so these are all the column names. So if we go down to the bottom, which had users, like the pictures one would have probably been title, image, cache, whatever that is, and the, the users one will be login and password. Cool. So you see how we can get the table name and the column names from doing SQL injection? Cool. Demo of the web exercise. All right, well, let's, let's finish this off. Um, so now that we know that it's in the table called users, we want to select from <coughs> users, and instead of selecting column name, we want to select password and login. 
so there's the password hash. And if we view the page source, the login is admin. So the admin user has the password hash, this. So to finish it off, um, I don't know if I've got internet. I don't have internet. So you can Google MD5 hashes, which this looks like, and they'll probably be hashed already on, like solved already on the internet. So you can just Google it if it's an easy one, or you can crack it with a program which I don't have installed. <laughs> Oh, I do, and I'll show you that later on. Okay, so that was the demo. Does that make sense? Is that amazing, or are you guys kind of numb because you saw it two weeks ago? It's good. Cool. That solidifies knowledge. Cool. It's, it's good. All right. So more cool things we can do. Uh, we can do a sleep statement. So rather than selecting a table name, we can just say select blah and sleep 15. And this will sleep the database for 15 seconds. So your page will take 15 seconds to load. Um, so if it doesn't get executed, like if it's being escaped or if it's being filtered or if it's not being executed in the database, then nothing will happen. But if it is, then it will sleep for 15 seconds. So you can tell because your page will suddenly take 15 seconds to load rather than like one. Why would you want to do that? Hold that, hold that thought. Uh, we can also do a benchmark command so we can run five million times the command and code message with this key and that'll also take a long time so that'll if we can't do sleep we can do benchmark. Does that depend on the database? Yeah this is for MySQL. But other databases have different similar things. So if there's no error outputs, so if we have like when we typed in to quote, we got a thing saying there's an error. If we got the same page, how could we tell if it was actually exploitable or not? What have we just seen? I had more stuff in there and took it out. So that answers your question, I think. Sleep. Yep, yeah, so we could do a sleep thing. <laughs> so, right. Uh, yeah, so, so let's do that. Um, two and sleep 15. Um, does this depend on the end of the query? Yeah, it depends on if we're at the end of the query as well. So you can see that it hasn't loaded yet, which probably means it's sleeping for 15 seconds. 15 was a very long time. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, okay. Should you use that, is that, that, sorry. Is that a security measure? Like, it won't show. Yeah, so some people try to secure things by not showing error output, but we can still get around it by doing things like the sleep thing. What were you thinking? I was going to say that. Cool. But like, then how, how would you, like, if you wanted to see the password, like, do the same kind of process? You can do stuff like that. If the password starts with... Yep, yeah, hold, hold that thought, because we're going we're gonna to get there. It's going to be amazing. So, yeah, it's called blind SQL injection, which means we can't see the output, and we can do black magic. So I just copied this from the internet. This does uh, select star from the sample table where id equals one and sleep um, if this thing is true. So select cast, so it casts it to an integer, no, it casts it to a signed thing. Uh, select the table name from the tables where schema equals database limit one offset zero. So what that means is get the first character from the table name and if the regex is true, that it is the start of the line and then an A to M, then this will return true, which will be cast to an integer, and so sleep will happen. It'll be zero, uh, 1 times 15, because it's true. Otherwise, if this is false, then it'll be a 0, which cast to an integer is a 0. Um, 0 times 15 means sleep for 0 seconds. So you can see if the first letter of the database name is between A and M, you will sleep for 15 seconds and otherwise you won't. So you, you can time your responses. Yeah, exactly. So it's just a binary search, which I think you guys have learned. If we have the alphabet, A to Z, and so now we know it's in this half, for example, between A and M, and so eventually we can narrow down and go, oh, it's B. But this is, this is the encrypted password, so it's not getting this and then decrypting the password, checking if the unencrypted password is... Prepared. No, this is, this is just taking the table name or the, de the encrypted password, okay. if we had the password hashes stored. Yeah, so that's what it actually does. And then you can go query for, for the table name. 
Yeah. So once you have the table name, you can know which table you're exploiting and then use that in your select statement and then do more sleeps to see if the password starts with A, starts with B, starts with C, or is between A and Z, and, or A and M, and so on. Seems, um, seems like a table of time. Yes, so as this slide says, it's easiest to write tools to do this than to do it by hand. So you don't want to do this by hand unless you really need to do it and don't have anything to program on, Which, in which case, how are you hacking a website? Maybe you're doing it by, I don't know, whistling into a phone or something. <laughs> so if you have a computer, which you probably do, you can write a, a script to do this and automate it, which is one of the Nutus 15 or something. Um, this is later. I think it was about 17. Yeah, 17. It was the last one when I did it was this, which took me a very long time. But it was so such a good feeling when I got it done. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so the general rule of thumb is try and divide your search space in half. So if you're searching, like you know your password is, has some number of letters and it's between A and Z or you don't even know that, you can get the, the ASCII value and see if it's between zero and half of the ASCII range, which is 255 I think for characters or whatever. And so you can, you can cut it in half until you found the character, which will take, um, how, many, how many calls would it take in the worst case to work out the first letter. Half? Why why thirteen? Yeah, it's gonna be log base two of the number of letters. Yeah, which is like four or five I think for the alphabet. So if it's four or five per thing and it's say a ten character password, then it's only gonna take like forty calls, which is Nothing for yeah, a computer program to do. Set, like, sleep for two seconds. Yeah, or probably not too small, because if it's too small, then the noise will get lost. Like, you don't know if it was just a slow internet connection or if it actually yeah. was sleeping. Can yeah. you just exploit the parallelism of like, a web server and make 26 connections? <laughs> Depends on whether it sleeps the whole database or just sleeps that thread. But generally, if it sleeps the whole database, the DB admin will notice and will stop you. So, <laughs> gotta be chill. All right. So, does this stuff all make sense? All of the SQL what that we've covered. Just want the first letter. Uh, the first letter, and then you get the second letter, and the third letter, and the fourth letter, and so on. So, once you knew it was B, you change your regex on the regex slide from this to be like B, and then A to M, or so on. Cool. So. There are some cool tools we can use, and one of them is called SQL Map. It's an automatic tool that will detect and exploit your SQL injection, but it doesn't always work. And if you do an exam for a security course at this uni, it won't work in the exam. Like they they sit at the exam so that it doesn't work. Is SQL Map open source? Yep, yeah, I think so. Pretty sure I've seen the source code. You can edit from that and build as in because it would surely it would just have a list of those. Um, things that are added into the URL and see if they work, and you could sort of edit Yes, it's a very, 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 very long list. It's just, it's just a brute force kind of yeah. approach. Um, so, but it's very powerful. You can point it at a website and say, give me the whole database for this website, and it'll just do it. <laughs> so I believe my next slide says do a demo. Um, so is there any way to test for a, mm -hmm. any intrusion detection system? Uh, just if it crashes, or if it's getting inconsistent results. So. <laughs> yeah, or if you get arrested, but never do those on websites that you haven't been told you're allowed to do it on, because that's a bad idea. Like, okay. So SQL map, when you run it, it's a Python script, so you just run it like that, and it says missing an option. So you need to get the URL, which I believe is this one here. So dash u for URL. And if you put a star in for the one that you think is injectable, it'll just say, oh, I found a star, I'm going to try and hack that. So we can also do dash dash wizard, which basically does everything for you. So post data, there's none. Difficulty, let's just say normal. Basic, oh, let's, let's, yeah, let's go basic. Um, it's run, and oh, it's finished already because I already ran it before. So it's gone through the database. Um, maybe I should delete my, just so it actually runs and looks interesting. So it runs for a while and hopefully should give some pretty feedback saying that it's finding stuff. But maybe I'd turn that off. 
Oh no, Wizard doesn't do pretty feedback because it's noob friendly. Um, so let's turn Wizard off. Process that. There we go. So it's saying that it's connected to the URL. It's found that it's ASCII. Um, there's an error in the response page, which thought that's a warning. Okay. Um, seeing if the URL is stable, so if it changes when you reload the page. And it is stable, seeing if the thing is dynamic, which means you can change it, I think. Um, and it says, heuristic shows that it might be injectable, possible MySQL. And so it says, do you want to keep trying MySQL or do you want to try something else? So let's skip everything else because we know it's MySQL. Um, do you want to include or test for MySQL? Yeah, sure. So now it goes through and tries a bunch of things. So this is like trying, you know, putting a quote in the field, trying putting like a select union select stuff. So it's got error-based where or having clause. Um, and then it's got inline queries, stacked queries, I don't know what those are, time-based blinds that's doing the sleep thing that we talked about. So it's doing that and it's taking a while so it must be finding something. Maybe it does take a long time. There we go. So yeah, it does a union query 1 to 20 columns, so it tries union select to see how many columns it is. Um, yeah, so it says it's union injectable with four columns, which is what we found. And then it's saying it's a union query injectable, and it's vulnerable. Do you want to keep testing the others? Well, we don't, because we know this is the only one, so we'll say no. And so now it says, OK, we've found it's a Boolean-based blind, error-based. Like, we found these vulnerabilities, and we've logged it to this output. The output just shows this. But what we can do is dump all, and that will go through the whole database and dump the whole database. So it's found the ID thing and it's gone, it's found admin and a password hash and it's saying, do you want to crack this password hash? So let's say yes. Um, store it and then do you want to crack it? Yeah, let's do a dictionary based attack. Um, we'll use the default dictionary file. Common password suffixes, no, because we know it's going to be in the dictionary. So now it goes through and tries a bunch of dictionary things. Oh, look, we found the password as password. <laughs> And so now it goes through all the rest of the tables, which there are like 20 minutes when I ran it before. So it's finding you know, all those table names this whole port is going to get all of these and put them all into a text file wow. saying all the database contents. So while this runs, I should be able to... Yeah? So does SQL map have its own dictionary or did you load one in uh, It just came like this. Okay. Cool. So we have dump. <laughs> so it's got these are the field, the database it's just found. So if a cat uses, it's got ID, login, password, and pictures. We've got the hacker Ruby and Cthulhu, and categories. We've got title, uh, test rocks con in twenty ten. Cool. So SQL map is ridiculously powerful and does many things for you and it's pretty simple to use just got to put the star in the field that you think is injectable and it'll magically hack it for you um, so any questions about this yeah so if uh, technically this whole insecurity comes from uh, the HTTP, pro HTTP protocol where you're passing crap through the URL right so the insecurity comes from when they wrote the website, the source code didn't check, didn't sanity check the thing before passing it to the database. Okay. So in a language like Python, when you do that, you can't do that. You can't pass it to the database. It's got to be escaped. And so no matter how you do it, it's going to escape it. And it's going to get rid of things like quotes and get rid of things like, you know, things that can actually be in the database. But PHP doesn't do that unless you try very hard. So it's very easy in PHP to make something exploitable. Isn't there ways to pass data to the database without having it come up in the URL? Yeah, so you can do post data as well. So why hasn't whatever way that uses the URL been deprecated? Because the post data is just as, just as hackable. Oh, okay. You can use that proxy we saw last time, but proxy, and then you can just change it through that. Okay. Or in SQL map, you can say the post data is this, and then change it in SQL map. It also is more um, search engine friendly if your website uses SQL. Mm -hmm. Oh, really?
Cool. Cool.